It's not a controversial statement to say that Call of Duty has seen better days. Despite being relatively popular, at least, if you categorize its success by sheer numbers, it doesn't seem to be doing that bad. Warzone is fairly popular right now, and it looks like the most recent entry in the franchise, Modern Warfare 3, has been enough to prevent the downward spiral it was caught in with Modern Warfare 2 just last year. But why did it ever end up on the ropes to begin with? Well, aside from the infernal attachment to our mortal coils and the finality of the passage of time, which is a roundabout way of saying things get old and less popular, the game is probably the most polarizing first-person shooter on the market right now. On one hand, everybody who plays first-person shooter games has probably played it at some point, and probably really enjoyed playing it too. But then, Call of Duty kind of stopped being cool. At least, unless you were really into its esports scene. And even then, that's still a relatively niche esports scene. How did Call of Duty go from universally loved to universally hated? We just uploaded a video about Helldivers 2 and feel like that game's ability to commit to a certain creative vision and stick to it was hugely instrumental in its success. But that game had a relatively small team and a relatively small budget compared to the Call of Duty Studios and of course Activision Blizzard. Hopefully this video provides a cautionary tale of the Icarus of first person shooters, a franchise that soared to great heights but ultimately got too close to the sun. This is the story of Call of Duty's decline. Call of Duty was unique in the sense that it was able to take multiplayer arcade FPS mechanics and sell them at a widespread scale everybody could get behind. The game was well regarded for its immersive storytelling, its single player component. What a lot of people don't know about this franchise is that it at one point tried to make a play for cinematic immersion, with famous depictions of events like the Battle of Stalingrad wherein the player had to pick up a rifle off the ground of a fallen soldier, armed only with a clip of ammunition in their hand. The games also featured the Normandy invasion, with the vicious rain of MG42 fire from entrenched positions right in front of you. It actually wasn't until Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare when it took a decisive setting difference, putting you in the shoes of a thrilling action movie ride, incorporating political gambles from Middle Eastern warlords to Eastern Bloc crime syndicates. Artistic depth and scope from the sound effects to the environments and the voice acting all played a role in making creative, interactive narratives. Right. What the hell kind of name is soap, eh? How to Muppet like you past selection. And this is sort of where the culture of the game solidified. It solidified itself with a pretty robust single player level design theory showcase. Call of Duty 4 was well known for a couple of missions, one of which put you in the hands of the guns on a titanically destructive AC-130 gunship. The distance from the carnage and the laws of physics taken into account, the time it takes for the shells to reach their target while you wait. Silently, you see explosions, gunfire, and the casual nature of the crew members as they command something that seems akin to an ominous dragon just looming above in the sky. Wolf, are we going to commandeer civilian transport on the main highway? Cover us! Ground units are requiring alternate transport at this time. <laughs> but that guy's best. It's a nice truck. Nah, <laughs> he's scared shitless. You also had a mission that featured crawling on your stomach behind enemy lines in a ghillie suit to stop an illegal arms deal between bitter actors on behalf of the Soviet Union's old, quite literal, fallout. It was not irrelevant in popularizing the radioactive mythos of the Ukrainian city of Pripyat to an entire generation of young men and boys. Pripyat, an almost supernaturally eerie feeling ghost town that acts as a sort of time capsule into the Soviet culture of the 80s. Just Captain McMillan, your lead on this op, ended up becoming a notable character in just one mission out of the entire game. The sequel offered dramatic visuals like the White House of Flame from Russian Invasion. Call of Duty Black Ops would trek around the globe, evoking the mood of old school Cold War spy thrillers, even taking nods from a previous installment in the timeline that took a crack at World War II once more, unique that time around for offering a focus on the Pacific Front as U.S. Marines are face-to-face -face with Japanese soldiers running straight towards you from a concealed jungle landscape. 
the sweltering heat gleaming through dense, thick tree lines, screaming in rage with bayonets attached to their rifles. Then the next minute, you would be sniping and scurrying your way through war-torn Stalingrad again, with a Soviet sergeant played by none other than Gary Oldman, who would go on to win an Academy Award for his portrayal of Winston Churchill in the film Darkest Hour. For three days, I have hunted him. For three days, luck alone has saved his wretched life. My name is Victor Reznor! And I will have my revenge! You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth! Over time, Call of Duty developed a shared and loved culture and cast of characters. But you came for the campaign and stayed from the multiplayer. While one of these things was what made Call of Duty a cultural staple, the other was what made it an exercise in multiplayer FPS design. Call of Duty was responsible for create a class, and that longevity has ramifications throughout the industry to this day. Just about any shooter game made in 2024 will have some kind of modularity involved in terms of what stuff you want to bring into the battlefield. But create a class has almost created an FPS ocean that we've been swimming in for many years, and we're more or less fish who've forgotten we're in water. Call of Duty was a victim of its own success in some ways. It developed a framework for which many FPS games were built on, but it couldn't really tack one way or the other without a huge amount of pushback. It was a fish that could grow wings, but couldn't breathe air. Call of Duty was responsible for innovating arcade multiplayer FPS. Quick time to kill, fast paced movement, and personalization was the name of the game. But the game certainly looks, feels, and plays very differently now to then. Obviously, we can have a full separate conversation about the artistic side of things, and that will certainly be elaborated on. But before we do that, it's important to contextualize that this was still FPS game design in its childhood. Not quite its infancy, but we were still kind of coming to grips with what we could make an FPS game do at scale and at mass market. The point is, the game had large scale and breadth in terms of the sandbox and space it constructed. What it had a harder time figuring out was the nuts and bolts. The game went through tons of different iterations with create a class, and that's usually what made it distinct among each individual title. And from game to game, each Call of Duty sort of had a unique identity due to this. But at a certain point, a new game coming out every year started to get a little bit old. At a certain point, you needed to do new things. One example they tried to do was lean more into the movement. This is where the subgenre of so-called movement shooters began to emerge. Now, Call of Duty was not responsible for the genesis of movement shooters. That had been happening in the background for a while. But Call of Duty was so big that it couldn't just ignore this part of the FPS space anymore. However, the games grappling with this topic did a lot of damage to the brand, because it had a hard time trying to find the right way to do it before they finally just gave up. Call of Duty runs on a yearly release cycle. To offload the labor intensity and make sure there's a reasonable timeline of development, different development companies were allocated to individual titles. Another element was introduced to the Call of Duty carousel with the release of Advanced Warfare in 2014, developed by a third player. Sledgehammer Games. The only point at which the public was familiar with Sledgehammer was their involvement with the production of Modern Warfare 3 alongside Infinity Ward. Advanced Warfare was Sledgehammer's first solo project and a concerted, deliberate effort to lean into the game's potential as a movement shooter. In fact, it would be massive for demarcating a hugely controversial Rubicon. The exoskeleton in Advanced Warfare brings a ton to the table. You got speed and strength and verticality, new movement sets like boost and dodge and slam, the ability to use technology like the augmented reality system and the mag gloves for new ways to climb. I mean, it, it, it really, we call it the heart and soul of the Advanced Soldier and everything it brings is really a, a pretty radical new way to play Call of Duty. The Jetpack COD era. <laughs> Now here's the thing, the jetpack shooter era didn't start here, because Titanfall had just released earlier in the spring. 
Titanfall was unique in the offering of a new spin on the arcade shooter formula, this time throwing in high-speed jetpacking, wall running, and fast-paced gunplay. What savvy people are surely thinking of is the lineage of Titanfall. It is shared in Call of Duty, developed by Respawn, its genesis enshrined by former Call of Duty devs. Now, Advanced Warfare featured the exosuit. It was designed to wink and nudge in the direction of popular sci-fi movies and TV at the time. From Elysium to Oblivion to Edge of Tomorrow, the opening kick of the World Cup this year was a paraplegic wearing an exoskeleton. I mean, it's, it's really a remarkable invention of technology today, and as the cornerstone to Call of Duty, it's, it's given us a ton of potential. Okay, so when you think of a jetpack in a video game, what do you usually think of? The first time I played with a jetpack in a shooter game was Star Wars Battlefront. No, not, not this one. Go back a little bit more, sister. Yeah! Okay. So the Dark Trooper basically got launched way up into the air really quickly, which was really useful for traversal. You could get up to high elevation or go across chasms in a way that other characters couldn't. But your mobility advantage was offset by only being able to fight at close range with a shotgun. This is not like the last jetpack cod in the series, Black Ops 3, which was much more floaty, kind of like a dragonfly hovering around. This movement is deliberate, punchy, it has weight to it. There are stakes for making the wrong movement tech at the wrong time. Momentum is involved, and that's essentially what Advanced Warfare was too. You can jump up, then go to the side, or go down for a little slam, and a little slide, slide to the left. And it looks simple, but when you watch the movement lobbies of Advanced Warfare that are apparently still around in 2024, you'll find that there's still a community that plays the game to this day because they just... They just vibe with the movement. We ran a poll on the couch to see what you guys felt. And it seems to be the consensus that Black Ops 3 was the most beloved jetpack COD. Probably to nobody's surprise, Infinity Ward's entry the year after did not rank very high at all. Still boasting one of the worst like to dislike ratios in YouTube video history with its launch trailer. This three year stint of movement COD probably set the groundwork for more frustrating decisions later down the line as the developers had a tough time trying to ascertain what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2019 leaned heavily into a very particular kind of vibe. A vibe that emphasized raw, gritty, operator, tactical sorts of stuff. The game got a fresh new paint job with a new engine, and in particular, much more cinematic presentation. Reloading animations were poppy, snappy, you could feel every click, clack, patty whack with camera shakes. It was in your face and very upfront about what it was. A return to form. It was also, more importantly than anything else, not a jetpack cod, which meant that the movement was slower. Damn. Sorry, hold... <sighs> something's... Which meant that the movement was slower... Which... Look, I'm not mad, I just... I don't, I don't know what's happening. Which meant that... that we... <sighs> movement is incredibly important in this game if you want to be a good player. To be completely it's transparent, the person creating this video is not knocking any of the content creators that were just referenced. But it shows an example of how art style doesn't translate to gameplay mechanics, especially when you're trying to get away from a jetpack kind of sci-fi setting. These guys have jetpacks. Of course they'll slide around. These guys don't. Who played these kinds of games? Everybody. Your dad, your uncle, the manager at your gym. Every dude, every dude played Call of Duty. And then dudes kind of stopped playing it. Gaming in general became a much more mainstream hobby, but the only kinds of people who still play COD are probably just really dedicated FPS nerds. It's popular, yeah, but it's not really popular in the same way it used to be. Now there's a time investment, kind of like 40K. People want to be good at the video game and they want to feel rewarded when they make a good play. The greatest twist of irony then was how Call of Duty tried to establish itself in this new shift by putting a certain coat of paint on the game, a certain kind of art style, but still making it very clear, this is a video game, not real life. And remember, single player campaigns used to be a pretty important component of the experience. The culture was, you played the single player, you had fun, then the multiplayer was the side product that sustained itself over time. You'd throw out some map packs for a little more dough, and then on to the next one. But Call of Duty, despite changing up the mechanics a little, the basic gameplay loop, domination, search, etc., create a class. That was still the same. 
MLG trick shotters and hyper sweats were a thing back in the day, but it wasn't really cool yet. It was just kind of a thing some kids did if they were really into it. Now, everybody consumes content online, and what looks cool in a YouTube video is what people are gonna try and emulate. So we started dropping terms like slide canceling. What the heck is a slide cancel? Yo, how do I slide cancel in this game? Can you slide cancel in this? I don't even know. Nah, you can't slide cancel in this one. <laughs> a slide cancel is exactly what it sounds like. You go into the slide animation, then quickly reset it so you can get your gun up and shoot. In the context of a shooter game, a fun little mix-up to throw your opponent's aim off. Now, when we talk about this stuff, we don't sound like we're talking about a shooter game anymore. When I think of shooter game, I think of skulking around in a bush, my positioning, my relation to the opponent, my aim, shoot, and then the kill, bada bing, bada boom. Now I gotta do this and this at the same time? I gotta shoot and move? You esports sweats are ruining my fun. The biggest component of the disconnect for the series started here. Because on one hand, you had a kick it and relax kind of gamer on the couch, Call of Duty to every guy shooter for, let's face it, people who didn't play shooter games all the time. It was supposed to be the one shooter game everybody had. Then the shooter game nerd, who's played everything, Titanfall, Battlefield, Halo, Gears of War, Rainbow Six, who knows what else, comes into the fray, and then suddenly you get this casual versus esports war. And this is happening across the entire industry. We just spent three years trying not to make the game too inaccessible with advanced movement, to make more games where the most involved player could slip and slide all over the place and make this look a lot more like this. The immersion was broken, and we sat there, growing up, during the Call of Duty beta overnight. Our childlike fascination with the virtual world, gone. Manipulated and twisted, so that you could slide and not slide. Look what you did. Well, nearly every industry took a financial hit this past year. The gaming world saw massive growth. NPD reports a 33% increase in overall spending. But Warzone in 2019 was what set the stage for Call of Duty's popular fame moving forward. We had Call of Duty Vanguard. <coughs> oh, sorry. Black Ops Cold War does something a little different. Hey. Let's have the new style of COD, but let's make the time to kill just a little bit longer, like it was way back in the day. So instead of three bullets, it's more like four or five. Tracking the target means you gotta have better accuracy and follow through throughout the course of the engagement, which means that if somebody can do the cool little slip and slide, there's a little more dueling. There's a little bit more combat that feels back and forth. And then Modern Warfare 2 comes out, again, and slows everything down super slow. Basically, Call of Duty, if it was Tarkov, Tark of Duty. Fast time to kill. Slower, deliberate movement. Ish. And then it almost kills the franchise. Round and round it goes. Where COD goes, nobody knows. Call of Duty was so big that it couldn't become anything specific. And it did the cardinal sin of AAA gaming. Trying to please everyone and pleasing no one. One talking point that permeates extensively throughout the industry is just how multiplayer games look. Whether people like it or not, Fortnite made everybody fall in line with the world of multiplayer microtransactions. And if you can cut a deal with a corporation to represent Warhammer 40k, you're gonna do it. But Fortnite didn't really have a particularly specific art theme direction. Call of Duty did. Multiplayer matches of Call of Duty were pretty simply laid out. Here's a map. What are the two appropriate factions here? It's the Russians versus the Germans. Each faction even had a unique track that would play before you rolled into battle and unique uniforms to each of those factions. Capture the objectives. Nowadays, Call of Duty may play up the cinematic vibe a little bit. It does so in the single player campaigns, but it tends to be this way only at the beginning of the new release. As the game ages, people buy the new anime skin the new esports skin, and all sorts of flashy and shiny colors, shiny colorful bullets, assassination animations, entire cosmetic kits that are designed around a certain design theme. It's not to say that they're not creative, they certainly are. One creative nod to FPS gaming history features the game's double barrel shotgun, operated and animated like the one from the classic 90s FPS game Doom. 
complete with the sounds, jerky frame rate, animations, and everything else in between. But most of the skins usually just consist of taking XYZ gun and making it pink or blue or red or based off a famous superhero or something. Cosmetics have taken a decidedly strong seat in front of the vibe. The tactical Oscar Mike over and out vibe. It doesn't affect gameplay. It just feels weird. And that weird disconnected feeling is just kind of icky. That's all there is to it. There's no particularly empirical metric about it. Something's just kind of off. It feels like the identity, the heart of the game just isn't really there anymore. And sure, the game is fun. If you really, really do like the gameplay, it's bizarre to consider how we got here in the first place. Modern Warfare 3 doubled down on the demand for faster pace, flashy movement, and longer time to kill after the series spent several years deciding whether or not it wanted flashy movement. Modern Warfare 3 ended up releasing on a year and a half long turnaround. So it begs a better question. How come Activision Blizzard was so disconnected from the ground game of its production? Call of Duty is a massive license. And as many problems show in terms of size attribution of games, if the game is too big, you can end up with too many cooks in the kitchen and a lack of a clear vision and lack of a creative approach. Comparatively, Helldivers 2 is killing just about every shooter game on the market, at least for now, with a modest dev team for a $40 release. And the finals, a relatively new free-to-play game, has attracted a modest following for a fraction of the development costs of your typical blockbuster Call of Duty game. It seems that nowadays, Call of Duty is a lot like Marvel movies. There were some beloved Marvel movies, and some of the ones in the formula later on down the road still did really well and were universally praised and respected. Cultural staples. But when's the last time you've heard someone talk about a Marvel license recently? Dune Part 2 was made with a little under $200 million with a smaller budget than Ant-Man and the Wasp. Call of Duty represents more than just aspects of the gaming industry that need critical attention. It represents just what not to do to remain sustainable in the entertainment industry. It's emblematic of what happens when talented, passionate devs are stuck at the beck and call of a large conglomerate decision-making process that is disconnected from what's going on inside the building, what's happening in the day to day. Is it possible for Call of Duty to get back to where it sort of was? Is it possible for that passion to return? We're just gonna have to wait and see. Forward area clear. Coast is clear. 